When Imperial Japan launched its attack on a great number of countries in the Pacific, hundreds of thousands of Allied prisoners of war were captured. What would follow for those captured would be some of the most horrendous treatment imaginable. Ranging from beatings, death marches, all the way to witnessing your comrades being cannibalized by Japanese soldiers. Prisoners face death on a daily basis. In today's video, we will cover the varied and disturbing punishments and violence inflicted upon Allied prisoners of war by the Imperial Japanese Army. It is perhaps important to point out that this video will be focusing on the fate of Allied soldiers upon being captured by the Japanese Empire. The fate that befell Allied citizens, whilst comparable, is slightly different. As too is the fate that would befall Chinese civilians and prisoners of war, a grim example being the fate of those who were experimented on in Unit 731. Nor is it a video to cover the fate that befell a number of women who ended up into forced Japanese military-run brothels. Each of these deserve a video in their own right. Also, when referring to Allied soldiers in this video, we will be referring to American, British, Dutch, Indian, Australian, Burmese, Malay, Tongan, Fijian and all other British colonial forces. It is perhaps helpful to start with the 1929 Geneva Convention as to how prisoners of war were to be treated. Whilst Japan was a signatory to the convention, they never ratified the rules and so largely ignored them. The Japanese military pushed for a society where racial supremacy and fanaticism mixed to create what was seen as the perfect soldier. Soldiers were taught that to surrender would break the Bushido code of honor and that those who did surrender would face horrendous treatment from their captors. The ethos that was developed stated it was preferable to die fighting than to even consider surrender. It was pushed that the Japanese were racially superior to all other Asian races, and that the darker one's skin, the lower in the racial order one was. Unsurprisingly, the job of looking after prisoners of war was seen as a role ill-befitting to such indoctrinated soldiers. It was therefore common for older or incompetent officers to be given the duties of guarding and managing prisoners of war. This disastrous combination of hatred of those who surrender, with mismanagement of the prisoner's basic needs, would lead to much unnecessary suffering. When Japan entered the Second World War, its goal was to remove the European and American colonial influence over the region. In the 1930s, Japan had already conquered parts of China and upon their entrance into the war launched attacks all over the Pacific. American, Dutch and British colonial holdings were all targeted and so too were neutral countries such as Thailand. This led to the Japanese obtaining much needed resources and creating a defensive perimeter around Japan, but they also obtained thousands of captured prisoners of war. Little regard for the well-being of captured soldiers was given by the Japanese captors. Seen as cowards, scoundrels, or the lowest of the low, these prisoners of war represented something that indoctrinated soldiers could not see themselves become. No better example of this disregard can be seen in the Bataan Death March. The Japanese severely underestimated how many prisoners they would capture, and so were ill-prepared to house and care for the men. Some 66,000 Filipino and 10,000 American soldiers were made to march 65 miles to a prison camp. The men were divided into smaller groups, around 100 at a time, and made to walk the 5-10 to 10 day journey through horrendous conditions to San Fernando. On the way, thousands of men were starved of food, beaten by their guards, or executed for lagging. These men were treated a little better than cattle. Upon reaching San Fernando, the prisoners of war were crammed into small cargo trains. In such confined space, the heat, lack of air and water for those already exhausted men, led to men dying where they stood, packed tightly with those clinging to life. Only around 54,000 men made it to the final destination camp. However, the death toll is not confirmed as it is unknown how many of the 76,000 escaped into the jungles to continue the fight. Estimates for the dead range from around 3,000 to 15,000, the majority being Filipino. Camps soon had to be created both in occupied territory and in mainland Japan, 
Old colonial military buildings and prisons were used to house the prisoners. Many of the prisoners were sent to work in the mines and infrastructure projects for the Japanese war effort. One of the most famous of these was the construction of the Thai Burma Railway. By 1942, following defeat at the Battle of Midway, Japan could no longer rely on shipments by sea. Burma was to act as the staging ground for the invasion into India, but it needed reliable supply routes. It was decided that a railroad between Thailand and Burma would offer the best solution to this problem, but the methods employed to build the railroad would result in thousands of deaths. Some 60,000 Allied prisoners of war and around quarter of a million Southeast Asian men, women and children were used as forced laborers. Between June of 1942 and October of 1943, the prisoners of war and forced laborers laid over 250 miles of railroads. Around 600 bridges were built, perhaps most famous of all being the bridge over the River Kwai. Hundreds of camps all along the length of the route were established, each building sections of the track to speed up the process. The work was backbreaking, in the dense jungles and under the cruel watch of their Japanese guards. Mosquitoes, monsoon conditions and starving rations would result in thousands dead. The workers would be made to toil for as many as 18 hours a day. As for the food, it was often rotten meat or fish, with rice contaminated with glass, maggots or rat feces. The prisoners were kept in squalid camps where diseases such as dysentery would run rampant and were responsible for around one third of all the deaths. Those who were deemed to be not working hard enough would face severe beatings from their guards. By the end of the completion of the railway, around a quarter of the prisoners of war and over half of the Asian forced laborers were dead. Those who survived were skeletal, diseased and malnourished. As the war progressed, there was a need to concentrate the prisoners in Japan and relieve soldiers from guard duties. The prisoners of war were loaded into what was known as hell ships to be transported to Japan. These were ordinary merchant ships, used to move prisoners away from the advancing Allied forces, but would often be used to transport both Japanese soldiers and materials for the war effort. Hundreds of men at a time would be crammed into cargo holds, with little in the way of food or water. Due to the men being so tightly packed together, many would die due to asphyxiation. Others would succumb to dysentery or starvation. Some of the ships had been used to transport livestock, which left in a poor state only added to the horrendous conditions. But perhaps worst of all, the Japanese did not mark the ships to indicate to the Allied forces that they were transporting prisoners of war. Often these ships would travel without escort or at the head of a convoy, meaning many were targeted and sunk by Allied submarines, totally unaware that they were dooming their comrades to death. One grim example can be seen in the sinking of Shinyo Maru. Intelligence had indicated that the ship was transporting Japanese troops, but at the time of its sinking, it was actually transporting some 750 Allied prisoners of war. When the hell ship was hit by torpedoes, the Japanese guards started shooting the prisoners. In response, many fought their way out of the cargo holds, dodging machine gun fire and attempting to abandon the sinking ship. Of the 750 prisoners, 667 were killed, some of the escapees executed by firing squad once recaptured. In general, the death rates for the prisoners on board the hell ships would be around 20% or around 11,000 men. As for the camps in mainland Japan, they were largely built in industrial areas. The prisoners of war would be pressed to work for the Japanese war effort in manufacturing, laboring on docks or mining. Some 36,000 prisoners of war ended up on mainland Japan. Many were kept in old warehouses or old worker dormitories. Whilst some of the companies benefiting from the forced labor provided food, very often food was just rice and thin soup. Malnutrition and starvation were a matter of fact for the prisoners. 
Around 10% of the Allied prisoners of war kept in mainland camps would die as a result of their treatment. But perhaps the most shocking was the instances of cannibalism that some Japanese soldiers engaged in. One example can be seen in the case of Lieutenant Hisate Tomiyasu. He ordered the removal of at least 14 of the healthiest Indian soldiers, selecting one at a time over a period of time. The men's liver, thighs, legs and arms would be removed. They would then be fried and eaten. Another example, known as the Shishi Jima incident, involved eight American airmen who were shot down. Once captured, they were brought to the island of Shishi Jima, where they were tortured, beaten and executed. Some were beheaded, others beaten to death or stabbed with sharpened bamboo. The general who had ordered the executions reportedly whilst drunk, suggested digging up one of the bodies to eat. The man's liver and thigh muscles were removed, cooked and served to the officers in order to prove themselves. Only one of the airmen was managed to be picked up by an American submarine. This man was future president George H.W. Bush. Whether done to supplement their own meager rations or done to prove some twisted martial prowess, the cannibalizing of Allied prisoners of war did occur at an alarming rate. Yet, in the face of such hardship, the human spirit often came through. To push through another day and survive, the prisoners of war developed a number of ways to cope. Some painted and documented what they were enduring, using toilet paper, human hair and blood to catalogue what had occurred. Some, such as Australian doctor Ernest Worry Dunlop, displayed remarkable leadership when he looked after men working on the Burma Railroad. He defied his captors, treated the injured as best he could and kept morale high. Dunlop is often credited for the relatively high survival rates for Australian prisoners of war working on the railroad and was awarded a great number of honours for his role. Others sabotaged the work they were undertaking, such as leaving traps and debris on the railroads to impede supplies. Some attempted to escape captivity, knowing full well that their captors would publicly execute any who were caught, as a grim example to the other prisoners. As for the death rates, they would vary greatly depending on the camp, who was running it and what work was being undertaken. At some camps, only a handful of deaths were recorded. In some instances, disease would kill all prisoners at the camp due to poor management and the lack of healthcare. Overall, the death rate for Allied prisoners of war held by the Japanese was 27%. As a point of comparison, the death rate for Allied prisoners of war held in German camps was around 4%. However, for Soviet prisoners of war held in German camps, the death rate was around 57% largely through deliberate starvation. The treatment of Allied prisoners of war will remain as one of the darker parts of World War II. Through disregard to people seen as lesser and undeserving of humane treatment, or through sheer incompetence, much suffering was inflicted on thousands of soldiers. A great number of the Japanese officers responsible would face trial, and when found guilty, faced execution for their role in the fatal treatment of the prisoners under their care. In war, the expectation of decent treatment of captured soldiers should be non-negotiable, and yet, the mistreatment of Allied prisoners of war became the norm, and thousands suffered some of the worst fates possible.